Hi, this is Andy Hoffman, Marketing Director of Miles Franklin Precious Metals in our 28th year in business. It's early morning, Tuesday, April 4th, 2017, and the title of this week's audio blog is Very Scary Stuff with a Very Happy Precious Metal Ending. Now, it's very early Tuesday morning, as in 3 a.m., and given that I have a 7.30 a.m. podcast and an appointment thereafter, I wasn't planning on publishing an audio blog today. However, given the sheer amount of scary, pimbeeb stuff going on, i.e. precious metal bullish, everything else bearish, I couldn't resist, particularly given that due to my vacation last week, which I say in quotes, given that I wrote an article every single day, I haven't published a spoken blog entry in, two, in 10 days. And per today's very happy precious metal ending teaser, keep in mind that my last audio blog, published on March 16th, was titled The Inevitable Decisive 200-Week Moving Average War Victory, to which I'd like to add that be warned, if any anti-gold forces are listening, you'd best turn your headphones off, as you're not going to like what I have to say. Starting with some real-life evidence of just how moronic the Fed's contention that inflation is less than 2% is, even if, for the first time in years, the 100% rigged and 100% useless personal consumption expenditure inflator has breached that comically arbitrary and patently understated level. To wit, here's a rundown of some of the deflation I deal with daily, which I was reminded of by the homeowner's insurance renewal I received this week of a whopping 13% increase despite not having filed a claim for the 10 years I've held it. In fact, my annual policy premiums are now up roughly 150% over those 10 years, and this despite the fact that GEICO bundles my home, auto, and umbrella insurance policies claiming to give me a volume discount. To that end, my umbrella policy premium was also raised by 4%, and while my property taxes weren't raised this year, they were increased by 12% last year. But no worries, I still pay less than $5,000 per year for a beautiful home here in Colorado, compared to the more than $20,000 or I'd pay if I still lived in New York. Where, incidentally, I read this morning that more than a million people have left since 2010, just after I jumped ship in 2007. And if you think the New York exodus is powerful, consider that more people have left Illinois over that period than the next top five states combined. Incidentally, one could easily rename the Denver Boulder area California East, given how many hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of people are fleeing the nation's most expensive financial and political basket case of a state. Taking the deflation discussion a step further, my health insurance premiums, on an apples-to-apples -apples basis, considering my current plan provides far weaker protection than past plans, my health insurance will likely be close to 50% higher this year, and at least 100% higher over the past five years. My gym membership steadily rises by roughly 5% a year, as do my HOA dues, and thank God Ms. Sylvie will be graduating preschool this year so I can stop paying the exorbitant monthly fees. Conversely, my cable bill has been flat, but only because cable television, i.e. a want versus need good, is becoming rapidly obsoleted by modern media technology. And irrespective, I still pay a sky-high bill for internet connection, as around here, Comcast still has a monopoly in the all-important high-speed bandwidth area. And oh yeah, there's my cell phone plan, which now offers far more service in the form of the unlimited calls, texting, and gigabytes of internet usage I will never use, but refuses to decline in price. And of course, new phones are no longer free, so when the time comes to eventually upgrade my now five-year-old Galaxy S3, I think they're up to the S8 now, it will cost me at least $500 to replace. Frankly, the only cost that hasn't gone up materially is my car insurance, but only because, like a vulture, Geico is waiting for me or my wife to have a significant ticket or accident. And I haven't even gone into the looming cost of Sylvie's college education, which thankfully, given that she is only five, will likely be replaced by far more efficient educational systems by the time she's 18. Okay, that inflation rant out of the way. Let's move on to the extremely scary stuff dominating the headlines. In no particular order, given how it's become impossible on a daily basis to discern what's the most pimbeeb of all. And no, I'm not even going to rehash yesterday's massively PM bullish headline that China and Russia will shortly be introducing a bilateral trade settlement system based on gold, which I discussed in great detail in yesterday's Is Gold Money? China and Russia think so, and the whole world shortly will too. 
To start, I see that none other than New York Fed President Bill Dudley, who last week inspired my never-ending punchbowl article when he unexpectedly espoused extremely dovish sentiment, was at the Mia Culpa stand again yesterday when he admitted the $1.3 trillion government-fostered student loan bubble, which has doubled since the 2008 financial crisis, provides a significant economic headwind. This on the same day that global automaker, automakers massively missed March sales estimates, to the point that Ford's comments last month that the industry has peaked look more ominous than ever. Not to mention Morgan Stanley's report Friday predicting that used car prices could plunge 50% in the next few years, obliterating the massively over-leveraged, historically over-inventoried global automobile market. But don't worry, Trump's tweet storms will undoubtedly cause automakers to bring jobs back home, despite the fact that cost-free robots have replaced most of those jobs permanently, and that Mexican labor, even with a border-adjusted tax that will never be passed, is still likely less than 20% of the cost of American labor. Combined, the student loan and subprime auto lending bubbles are now larger than the subprime mortgage bubble of early 2008, with both starting to show dramatic increases in delinquencies. Only this time around, it's the government itself with the most exposure. Given that said student loans are LOL, the largest asset on its historically insolvent and comically unaudited balance sheet. Throw in the fact that in many markets, ZERP engendered bubbles have caused real estate prices to reach or exceed the 2007 highs with commercial real estate amidst an all-out retail Armageddon rising 25% above the 2007 peak. And you can see why it's not a matter of if, but when the big one hits. Only this time, it will be a lot bigger than 2008, with no means of being cushioned by the Fed, unless it decides to do what all central banks, man central banks managing fiat currency regimes have done throughout history when faced with a similarly dire Ponzi scheme situation, which is to hyperinflate. Just look at Venezuela if you think this can't happen, where the only difference between the hyperinflation the government's tripling of the monetary base in the past year has catalyzed and the deflation in Japan, despite an equal inflation of the monetary base, is the velocity increase caused by the loss of confidence that must inevitably arrive. This at a time when the federal government is mere weeks from exhausting extraordinary measures like stealing from pension funds and thus hitting the $19.9 trillion debt ceiling. But don't worry, I'm sure Donald Trump's massive tax cuts and huge fiscal stimulus plans will have no trouble passing through Congress. Perhaps like the nuclear option tactic the Republicans plan to utilize this week to get their candidate for Supreme Court justice appointed, and in the process ending democracy as we know it, Trump will executive order a totalitarian nuclear option for the executive branch, enabling him to enact whatever legislation he wants with absolutely zero congressional input. Hey, he's already allowed to declare war without congressional consent, as if they'd oppose it anyway, so why not a few new debt ceiling busting tax cuts? And sarcasm aside, trust me, that debt ceiling issue will not be resolved peacefully, let alone anytime soon. In other words, America is about to enter a debt ceiling crisis far worse than the 2011 episode, which yielded the stripping of the AAA credit rating and record gold prices, the 2013 episode, which produced the spending sequester that is about to be destroyed, and the 2015 episode, which produced the debt ceiling suspension that ended last month, combined. Not to mention the fact that it will occur simultaneously with an event that I truly believe may have Brexit times 100 ramifications for the global political, economic, and monetary realms, i.e. the French presidential election, whose first round is less than three weeks away. And did I mention the pending Greek default just three, me three months from now as well? Potentially, because not only do ragingly rebellious Greeks have no intention to continue bailing out their captors, but because the troika that administers them, i.e. the European Commission, the ECB, and the IMF, may not exist if Marine Le Pen is victorious in said French election. To that end, consider that back in 2011, I said that no major nation will ever see their credit rating upgraded until long after the current fiat regime dies, a prediction which, to this point, I cannot have been more correct about. To wit, just yesterday, the rapidly collapsing BRICS nation of South Africa was finally downgraded to junk bond status by Standard & Poor's as the anti-apartheid policies of its lunatic, and I kid you not, illiterate, 
Prime Minister Jacob Zuma, have put it on the brink of political and economic catastrophe. Gold priced in Rand is up 12% in the past three days alone, to nearly an all-time high. And when one considers that more than 5 billion people live in nations whose credit ratings are hovering just above junk bond status, in many cases principally due to bribing rating agencies who at some point must acknowledge the catastrophic reality of the situation, it's quite scary to realize how many currencies are on the verge of collapse which subsequently will cause a massive worldwide rush into precious metals for the handful of people who can get their hands on them. To that end, consider my article from Saturday asking if the cartel's silver Waterloo is imminent due to the expanding run on the COMEX's paper-thin physical inventories and record-high commercial short position as prices continue to surge higher. Heck, following up Bix Weir's amazing podcast from last month discussing how COMEX and LBMA paper silver trading volumes rose by more than 50% in 2016 alone, depicting just how much naked shorting is now required to prevent silver from exploding, Steve St. Angelo published an equally damning report yesterday describing how on a worldwide basis, Paper Gold 2 saw a more than 50% increase in 2016 trading as well. And then there's the United States of Dysfunction, where the unfolding Obama administration wiretapping scandal has the potential to escalate to a level far exceeding Watergate, at a time when the economy is on the ver already on the verge of collapse and the government on the verge of all-out political war. Again, I reiterate my newfound view that Trump won't survive four years in office, not because of any particular thing he's done or intends to do, but because the forces seeking to unseat him are so evil and so powerful. Not to mention the fact that just two and a half months in, it's becoming patently clear that his political friends are so few and far between, there's literally no chance he can get anything done. As we learned two weeks ago, when the hideous Trump Care merciless bill mercilessly failed to pass through the Republican-controlled Congress, and we'll learn in spades in the coming weeks, when an historic debt ceiling crisis all but grinds America to a halt. Heck, this week alone, we have the potential for a major crisis to be catalyzed when Trump meets with Chinese Premier Xi Jinping, who he has promised to attack for manipulating the yuan, stealing U.S. jobs, and escalating America's record trade deficits. This from a nation that owns more than $1 trillion of our treasuries, and through the cheap manufacturing they supposedly stole due to the bad trade deals America's traitorous corporate titans desperately lobbied for, enables historically poor Americans to buy cheap trinkets at Walmart. Not to mention historically poor Westerners of all kinds, as evidenced by yesterday's report that, pre-Brexit, Britons have an all-time low amount of savings which, when combined with the nearly all-time low purchasing power of the pound and all-time high banking system leverage, is a recipe for disaster nearly unparalleled on the planet. Except, of course, by most of its neighbors across the English Channel, from the dying pigs to the high and mighty France itself. And then there's the Fed's comical insistence that it will raise interest rates a pathetic two more times this year, which, if they did, would only take the Fed funds rate, currently at just seven-eighths of a percent, to just one and three eighths percent, i.e., barely above the lowest level Alan Greenspan took rates to in the wake of the dot com bubble crash. At a time when the U.S. debt was much lower, the U.S. economy was much stronger, and oh yeah, the Fed's balance sheet was just $800 billion, compared to $4.5 trillion today. Not to mention, it would be less than a quarter of the 80 year average of 6%, despite said inflation being the highest in U.S. history, assuming real inflation accounting is utilized to measure it. This, as actual market-based rates, continue to plunge, with yet again the top predicted nearly to the basis point by my January 11th article, 2.5% enough said. Just as it was in January 2014 when I penned 3.0% enough said. In both cases, I was predicting the top of the benchmark 10-year yield. In both cases, simply due to the common sense that told me the economy cannot handle rates any higher. And speaking of the dying economy, just how right can I have been about OPEC, which yesterday admitted that its March production cut compliance plunged, simultaneous with surging global non-OPEC production, record global inventories, and plunging prices. This, as we're just months away from the end of the production cut deal, which has to be reiterated or the price will plunge immediately. And trust me, falling oil prices alone will annihilate the global economy, taking thousands of commodity producers and dozens of nation states, like America's only Middle East ally, Saudi Arabia, with them. 
As for the Fed, only the PPT-supported stock market has enabled, enabled them to even pretend they can modestly raise rates, even if the net result is simply choking off an already dying economy further. Clearly, as I have reiterated ad nauseum, rising rates are not bad for precious metals, which ironically welcome, welcome such Fed idi idiocy, which only serves to destroy America's economy further. In the real world of hard data, GDP growth is already trending below 1% and much lower if said real accounting were utilized. And now even soft data is rolling over too, en route to an assured rendezvous with the 2008 lows, when said big one inevitably arrives, likely in my view much sooner than most can imagine. As for precious metals, on a day when the barrage of irrefutable proof of manipulation is exploding from the alternative media, from Bix and Steve St. Angelo to Craig Hemke, Andrew McGuire, and yours truly, consider that the single most precious metal important factor in years is playing out as we speak, per the aforementioned 200-week moving average war I have been exhaustively discussing all year. Remember, it was in April 2013 when it was first breached to the downside, after having traded above it for the entirety of the 2003 to 2013 precious metal bull but only after Obama's now infamous closed-door meeting with the top two big to fail CEOs, which Goldman Sachs signaled by the, that very, very same day, issuing an aggressive gold short recommendation, mere hours before the equally infamous alternative currencies destruction cartel raid that pushed prices down for the following three years, until they finally bottomed in U.S. dollar terms in December 2015, ironically, the very day the Fed first raised rates. In non-dollar terms, as described by the South African commentary above, precious metals have been in a raging bull market since, with gold in the vast majority of fiat currencies trading near, at, or in most cases well above previous all-time highs. However, here in the center of gold manipulation, prices remain well above their 2011 suppression highs, whilst the far more manipulatable silver market has suffered far more. However, prices have irrespective crept up for 15 months, in both cases temporarily breaching said 200-week moving averages to the upside just after the Brexit and on election night. Before in both cases the cartel went berserk pushing them back down. However, per the aforementioned Silver Waterloo article, I'm happy to say that the declining 200-week moving averages of both gold and silver have again been breached, as as I write, gold is trading at 1,258 per ounce compared to its current 200-week moving average of 1,246 per ounce, Gold silver is trading at 1834 per ounce compared to its 200 week moving average of 1813 per ounce. In other words, the happy precious metal ending of this audio blog, which in my view is about to become a lot happier in the coming weeks and months. And by the way, one note on Bitcoin before I go. Given that few realize its recent volatility was caused not by the failure of the SEC to approve the Bitcoin ETF, which, thank, which I'm thankful for actually, but because yet another attempt to hard fork the preeminent cryptocurrency was tried. Apparently, like the two others before it, that attempt will decidedly fail, and when it does, the powers that be will likely be contending not just with precious metals, but their twin destroyers of the fiat regime as well, for safe haven dollars desperate to escape history's largest, most destructive fiat Ponzi scheme. To that end, the need to protect yourself from what's coming, financially and otherwise, has never been more urgent. And if your desired protection prescription is precious metals, we humbly ask you to call Miles Franklin at 800-822-8080 or go to milesfranklin.com and register for online purchasing and give us a chance to earn your business. And as always, I can reach via email at ahoffman at milesfranklin.com. Thanks very much. Good is becoming rapidly obsoleted by modern media technology. And irrespective, I still pay a sky-high bill for internet connection, as around here, Comcast still has a monopoly in the all-important high-speed bandwidth area. And oh yeah, there's my cell phone plan, which now offers far more service in the form of the unlimited calls, texting, and gigabytes of internet usage I will never use, but refuses to decline in price. And of course, new phones are no longer free, so when the time comes to eventually upgrade my now 5-year-old Galaxy S3, I think they're up to the S8 now, it will cost me at least $500 to replace. Frankly, the only cost that hasn't gone up materially is my car insurance, but only because, like a vulture, Geico is waiting for me or my wife to have a significant ticket or accident. 
and I haven't even gone into the looming cost of Sylvie's college education, which thankfully, given that she's only five, will likely be replaced by far more efficient educational systems by the time she's 18. Okay, that inflation rant out of the way. Let's move on to the extremely scary stuff dominating the headlines. In no particular order, given how it's become impossible on a daily basis to discern what's the most pimbeeb of all. And no, I'm not even going to rehash yesterday's massively PM bullish headline that China and Russia will shortly be introducing a bilateral trade settlement system based on gold, which I discussed in great detail in yesterday's Is Gold Money? China and Russia think so, and the whole world shortly will too. To start, I see that none other than New York Fed President Bill Dudley, who last week inspired my never-ending punchbowl article when he unexpectedly espoused extremely dovish sentiment, was at the Mia Culpa stand again yesterday when he admitted the $1.3 trillion government-fostered student loan bubble, which has doubled since the 2008 financial crisis, provides a significant economic headwind. This on the same day that global automaker, automakers massively missed March sales estimates, to the point that Ford's comments last month that the industry has peaked look more ominous than ever. Not to mention Morgan Stanley's report Friday, predicting that used car prices could plunge 50% in its off, as you're not going to like what I have to say. Starting with some real-life evidence of just how moronic the Fed's contention that inflation is less than 2% is, even if, for the first time in years, the 100% rigged and 100% useless personal consumption expenditure inflator has breached that comically arbitrary and patently understated level. To wit, here's a rundown of some of the deflation I deal with daily, which I was reminded of by the homeowner's insurance renewal I received this week of a whopping 13% increase despite not having filed a claim for the 10 years I've held it. In fact, my annual policy premiums are now up roughly 150% over those 10 years, and this despite the fact that GEICO bundles my home, auto, and umbrella insurance policies, claiming to give me a volume discount. To that end, my umbrella policy premium was also raised by 4%, and while my property taxes weren't raised this year, they were increased by 12% last year. But no worries, I still pay less than $5,000 per year for a beautiful home here in Colorado, compared to the more than $20,000 or I pay. Hi, this is Andy Hoffman, Marketing Director of Miles Franklin Precious Metals in our 28th year in business. It's early morning, Tuesday, April 4th, 2017, and the title of this week's audio blog is Very Scary Stuff with a Very Happy Precious Metal Ending. Now, it's very early Tuesday morning, as in 3 a.m., and given that I have a 7.30 a.m. podcast and an appointment thereafter, I wasn't planning on publishing an audio blog today. However, given the sheer amount of scary, pimbeeb stuff going on, i.e. precious metal bullish, everything else bearish, I couldn't resist, particularly given that due to my vacation last week, which I say in quotes given that I wrote an article every single day, I haven't published a spoken blog entry in, two, in 10 days. And per today's very happy Precious Metal Ending teaser, keep in mind that my last audio blog, published on March 16th, was titled The Inevitable, Decisive, 200-Week Moving Average War Victory. To which, I'd like to add that be warned, if any anti-gold forces are listening, you'd best turn your headphones if I still lived in New York. Where, incidentally, I read this morning that more than a million people have left since 2010, just after I jumped ship in 2007. And if you think the New York exodus is powerful, consider that more people have left Illinois over that period than the next top five states combined. Incidentally, one could easily rename the Denver Boulder area California East, given how many hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of people are fleeing the nation's most expensive financial and political basket case of a state. Taking the deflation discussion a step further, my health insurance premiums, on an apples-to-apples -apples basis, considering my current plan provides far weaker protection than past plans, my health insurance will likely be close to 50% higher this year, and at least 100% higher over the past five years. My gym membership steadily rises by roughly 5% a year, as do my HOA dues, and thank Godness Sylvie will be graduating preschool this year so I can stop paying the exorbitant monthly fees. Conversely, my cable bill has been flat, but only because cable television, i.e. a want versus 